and welcome to another episode of The Heart of the Matter. Today we're talking about a subject that is really crucial to the future of Nigeria. We're talking about corruption in Nigeria. And with me I have two guests that are eminently qualified to discuss this subject with me. I have uh, immediately to my left Ms. Ms. Folashade Bankolio Oki. She is a legal practitioner a partner in her firm. She is, her firm is actively engaged in, uh, in litigation, and so she sees a, a, a world of corruption a, 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 um, from her perspective. Also with us today is Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, who is a lecturer in both international uh, law and commercial law at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. She's also very much involved in the a non-government world um, and so she's also seen a lot of things and between them they will open our minds and help us to understand both how the problem has arisen and what we can do as a people to cure the problem. So once again you're welcome to the heart of the matter. Ms. Falash Adiban Kolioki, you're welcome to the heart of the matter. It's my pleasure to be here. Dr. Jumoke Oduwale, you're welcome to the heart of the matter. Thank you very much. And that's the last time I'm going to call you by your full name. So <laughs> I think it's okay for us to just say Shade and Jumoke. Um, so, welcome to the heart of the matter. Now, corruption. Most Nigerians know that this nation has gradually slipped into a huge chasm of corruption. And some of the things that you hear are mind boggling. So I'm going to ask our guests, I'm going to engage them right away on, on, on just what caused corruption in Nigeria. Shadi, would you like to take that up with us first? What caused the problem? Well, it has been a gradual process. I, I, I can't pinpoint one particular instance, but I, I would like to say that it has started from the home, the values that are being passed down to the children who in turn expect money instantly, expect that they won't work for their money, expect that they want to drive the big cars that they see other corrupt people driving. So it's, um, it's a spillover effect and um, we have to look at the home first, then we go to the schools, then we go to the government, which unfortunately is the major corrupt body, um, I, I would dare say. I think that, um, and again, it starts from the top. If our leaders are corrupt, their servants will be corrupt. Jimoke, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think I agree very much with you. I think corruption is almost a personal mindset. And the problem that I see most with Nigeria today is that people assume that I'm not the one that's corrupt. Someone else is corrupt. Everything I do is okay. If I'm bribing for this, it's just for my convenience, it's just for speed. The government is the main corrupt. The government is from the people. And they don't develop horns just because they're in government. Everybody does things at a smaller level. So that's why I wholly agree with the issue of values. Our personal moral compass seems to have skewed somehow in the Nigerian setup, that the norm is now corruption. There's some people that say that we had a former head of state who declared when Nigeria was entering the oil boom years that money is not our problem, it's how to spend it. And that that statement, innocently made, sent a signal to Nigerians that if you don't have money, there's something wrong with you. Or if you do have money, then People must know that you have money. That's what, when we started this conspicuous consumption, they call it. But, Shade, you mentioned the homes. You said that's the very root of, of corruption. What can we do at home to, to, to minimize this problem? Well, we can first of all be an example. Because it's one thing to tell our children something. It's another thing to live it. I tell my children all the time, don't look at other homes and what cars they drive or you don't know how the parents got it. You, we should instill in them the fact that it is hard work, honestly done, 
don't try and keep up with the Joneses, you know, don't um, think that because my friend's father drives a Rolls Royce, I want to have one by all means, or, or don't develop a complex because your mates and your um, classmates have money when you don't. We, we have to try and teach the children that um, um, it's hard work, honesty, and there are repercussions for being dishonest. And then we have to live it. If we don't live it, they'll lose respect for us and they won't even listen to us. So it does start from the home, then it goes on to the schools and then to the universities. Okay. Jumake, you come from a younger home. Are there different challenges with the, can I say, youth of today, the younger uh, 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 families? Are there challenges that probably my uh, uh, generation or Shadi's generation didn't encounter? Um, yes, definitely. I'll say the parents are a lot busier now. The attention on the children is less. I may generalize and say we have a lot more help, domestic staff. Now a lot of people, middle class and above, have two or three domestic staff helping with raising the nannies while the, both parents are really very busy. And so you have different moral compass coming into the home. I think children now are more exposed to um, affluence at an earlier age. They have the same toys that the parents have. They have Blackberries, they have iPads. Um, they want those things. They know what designer clothes are. They travel. So all, all that, it, it's now harder to keep them on a steady you know, platform. Now, I know this is a personal question, but what do you, Jumoke, do with your family of young children? Yeah. Um, deliberately, I pray with them. My husband and I pray with them. We share the word with them. Um, but I guess a lot of people do that. But we visit orphanages. We give to the less privileged. Try to give them that compassion. Expose them to not everybody has everything. If you think your problem is that you, you're not traveling this summer or you don't have a Blackberry. Look at children that don't have food. So our, our children are very aware, even when we lived abroad, they're very aware about the inequity in the world. And just that sense of compassion, it makes them know that they don't need, it doesn't occur to them to demand certain things. Now, talk about time, because you mentioned time as one of the challenges. What can somebody, like yourself, who is very busy, um, husband very busy, a lot of work, a lot of responsibility. What can you do to ensure that you get family time, especially for the children? Well, the first thing is, if you, you have to make your choices. If you know that you're going to be actively involved in your career, then perhaps your social life is going to take a back seat because those hours have to be spent on your children. So perhaps your weekend will have less social activities because you have to do more bonding activities with your family. Um, I made a decision to leave investment banking. One of the primary reasons was to have more of a work-life balance. So as an academic, I'm very busy and I do have to travel quite a bit for conferences, but I can pick up my kids from school and then I, I'm writing at 4 a.m. So that's my personal choice. Yeah. But, but the thing is that the children get their place They have priority. to have it steady okay. and they have to have it constantly. Yeah. All right, now let's come back to the subject of corruption. corruption. I think things have gotten to a point in our nation now where people don't even realize what is or what isn't corrupt. Okay? Um, for instance, um, what other people call a kickback, somebody will say is a gift. Okay? What's your take? What's your take, Shani, on this? Well, as you've rightly said, there's a fine line between a gift, a thank you, or an inducement. Um, but we know the motives. So sometimes it's difficult not to fall into that mistake. Like, for instance, I, um, I, I have some colleagues that at the end of every year, they send presents to the judges. Now, Is that right or wrong? It's, there are two sides to the coin. Sometimes it could just be saying thank you for 
all the hard work you've done. Sometimes it could be saying, um, I know my colleagues are not listening, it could be saying, um, just take this present so that when my case does come up, it will be considered favorably. How do you, discern, how do you tell what is, what, what's what Well, we saying? know, we know, normally we know the dishonest ones and um, the a value? reasonable... Should you put a value to the kind of gifts? Again, it shouldn't be an inordinate price, you know. Um, so no, car. nothing like that, nothing like that at all. Maybe a tea set or a book or a perfume, that should be it. Anything that borders on a Rolex, wristwatch or a car, then there's a motive. But um, that, that's just one of the... Um, it's difficult to discern whether it's a, a, a bribe or an inducement or a thank you for what you've done. Everybody should search their mind and know what their motive is. I read scripture, I found that the Bible says that a bribe is given to blind the eyes of men. What blinds? I mean, you know, you talked about motive and motive is, 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 is critical because if your motive is to, to blind the eyes of the judge or the award of the contract to giving you favor, um, what, what's your take on, on the, the subject of? The thing about corruption is that just like truth doesn't change, a bribe, we really do know when something is a bribe. Because if you give me a gift this year and you didn't give it to me last year, because my position this year has changed, and if I retire next year, I don't get it, then whether it's just a nice book or, you know, it's still because of what you hope. Now, the fine line that a lot of people talk about in Africa is that we're gift-giving people. So yes, a lot of people feel strongly. I grew up in a family where you always take something. Your Yorubas always give things in pairs. It's rude to give just a single gift. There's that part of our culture. But Nigeria is at a stage where if we want to move forward, it's not so much about culture. It's about what's right and what's wrong. When you give a gift to induce a particular action from a person, then it's a bribe. I don't care whether it's just 200 naira tip so that you get a parking space or so that the hairdresser gives you preferential treatment. Those are the little things that, when it's now millions of dollars, you have no problem because your conscience has, has acclimatized. And, the, and on the receiving end, because corruption is two ways and people look a lot at the giver. On the receiving end, you say, oh, it's just a little thing. But that's like, Damisile, in front of you, 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 your gift has made a way for you. So, so, so giving the, the parking attendant 200 naira to, to park your car, it, it could be considered as a bribe. The way I consider it as a bribe is if, for instance, there are only 10 parking spaces and there are 20 employees and you, you're able to give a gift. You're able to give that 20, that 20 naira and tomorrow, it, they, they try as much as possible not to let the others come because they're expecting, they're looking forward, then there's an inequity. There's no longer a fair playing game because some people can't give that gift. So now your gift is making the security men, when your car is coming, they're already calling you. They're already calling you. So that inequity, we see it in bigger dimensions all around the country. Now, st still on the subject of corruption, because we've talked so far about financial corruption. Mm -hmm. What about the corruption in terms of our morality? Um, who wants to have a go at that? Morality. We all have personal core values. If we call ourselves Christian, 
We know what is expected of us. Honesty, equity, justice. When we don't live by these things, then it's a form of corruption. Our behavior is now corrupted in, in that sense of the word. So talking about, um, I, I think I put it under uh, honesty. What about marital fidelity? You, you know, there's a problem in, in that area in our country where, where, where people are doing whatever they want and um, nobody's calling, you know, some husbands even send their wives out to, to sleep with somebody so they can get a contract. You know, what's your take on this moral um, decadence that has hit our country? For me, I don't really separate financial corruption from, you see, Pastor, when you look at a person's moral compass, you can hardly find somebody who commits adultery, who will not be okay with giving or taking a bribe, who will not be okay with certain other, you know, if you are corrupt, it, it, it has to yes. Okay. And you're not somebody that can suddenly be oh, so morally upright all of a sudden. Because really, your moral compass is skewed, and, and you're not holding yourself to those high standards that you should live by. Shadi, do you want to come in here? Um, I, I tend to agree with Jumoke, but I think some people find it easier in some areas. Some people have a problem with money, so they'll tend to be corrupt in the money area. Some people tend to have a problem with morality in and out of marriage. So I think it's just like the devil will tempt you with what he knows you can't take. Some people are very strong when it comes to money matters and they can't be tempted. Some people aren't. So I guess everybody has their own threshold. And so that's where I tend to differ. Somebody might be very honest, morally upright, integrity, but when it comes to money, he, he loses it. <laughs> so. Okay, okay. We will. You, you know, recently um, in the United Kingdom, there have been cases of grooming young girls. People would wait outside the school gates and get children, 13, 14, 15, and begin to groom them and sell their bodies, really, for sex. Really? Okay? Mm -hmm. this, this is very... It's, it's, it's been making a lot of news lately. Now, it can't, we can't say that this is United Kingdom only, because that kind of thing is happening here. Um, there's a lot of, of grooming going on. There's a lot of, when I talk about infidelity, I'm not talking about in and out of marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about adultery. You know, the, the people are living such loose, morally loose lives that, that um, you know, that is corruption too. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Now, let's move on to talking about what are the concrete measures that can be taken to solve the problem of corruption? What do you think? You, yes, we started the home, but what um, measures can, can be put on ground that can solve the problem? Hmm. It's a very large scope, but I think um, every sphere of life can be dealt with separately. We face the legislature, the executive and the judiciary, each one of them should be washed out completely. For instance, the laws need to be changed for, for offenses, these low sentences, this rubbish plea bargaining, things like that, those have to be dealt with. The judiciary, it's been done for already. For the purpose of our audience who may not understand what plea bargaining <laughs> is, <laughs> uh, what... Um, <laughs> These sentences you're talking about, I, I, I'll give you one. The, the, the gentleman who um, got 750,000 uh, naira. <laughs> naira fine yeah. for embezzling 27 yes. billion. Yes. Whereas in the same week, yes. somebody was sentenced to jail mm -hmm. for yeah, stealing for a loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. So, so well, plea bargaining, what's that? Well, it, it's, it's an instrument that is used. It's a judicial instrument that is used outside this country to save the cost of going through a whole trial. It saves the government money by pleading to a lesser offense. However, in Nigeria, it's not suited to, to the Nigerian system because it's like an open door to corruption. Because um, if, it's not, um, if it's not supervised properly, the judge can give any, any sentence because 
the prosecution is involved, the defense is involved, the judge is involved. They can all get together and say, look, let him plead for something small. We'll give him the minimum sentence. I don't think we're mature enough yet for that type of process. As, you, as you've said, look what happened to the 750,000 sentence. There's so many other ones that we all know about. So unless it's supervised very well. So that should be thrown out for now. Um, there, there are many other things okay. that so can let be... Me, let, me, let me go to one, Jupe. Okay. Sanction. Um, we all heard about petroleum, um, what was it called now, fuel subsidies back in January last year. And up till now, even though some people are facing trial, not a single person has been sentenced for, for the subsidy scam. Uh, what should our position be towards um, crime and sanction? See, um, it's difficult to talk about crime and sanction in isolation from the whole society. Because like she was just saying, there could be a collusion, which is what we're really seeing. That's why the system is slow. That's why it appears like, you know, uh, the other day I was listening to Professor Shibaji talk about, I think Lagos State convicts, I'm not sure how many people, just a very small number in a year for crimes. While we all know that a lot of crimes go on every day, it's a systemic problem. And that's what's really worrisome about corruption in Nigeria, is that it has spread in tentacles to every nook and corner, every nook and cranny in the society. So when you want to talk about sanctions and crimes, you can't take it in isolation from the, the whole of the judiciary as a system, the executive, it's all intertwined, the legislature. Where do you really start? I think, solution-wise, it has to really be a personal decision because all those people come from within the people. Mm -hmm. Until I'm the somewhere. people, we all demand this of government, this of government, but till the people look in the mirror, how am I contributing to the problem? In my day-to-day, -day, if, you, if you look back on your day and just say, you know, what, what did I do? Was I in so much of a hurry that I beat this light, that I did this, that I did that? Till you're able to have a resolve to live right, then you have no moral authority to question anybody else. That's why the slippery slope happens and people cannot voice out because they know in their own corner of their heart that just if I was good. there, maybe I wouldn't do different. So. What else, Shade? what else is there that we can do about corruption? I mean, I, I see this affecting children. Um, children are beginning to, I mean, there's such a materialism mm -hmm. in our society that some children won't go to school in the wrong car. <laughs> okay? they, 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 there's a car, you know, they go to school in. Um, so what can, what can we do, you know, beyond just encouraging parents to spend more time with their children because some a corrupt parent spending time with a child mm. is going to corrupt the child mm. I, I think we should um, for those who really are interested we should um, I wouldn't call them NGOs but this awareness drive I think it should be taken to schools taken to universities let people come together I think it's something that Professor Shibajo was trying to do at one time you know go into the universities, you know, get a team. It's not really preaching, it's just about morals, awareness, consequences of being corrupt, you know, uh, talk about sowing and reaping. We can go into the schools, we can go into the ministries, you can have seminars or workshops. Just make a lot of noise and then the awareness is created with the press. The press play a very important role. And the press have started exposing people. I must say they're really doing a good job. The government can't be quiet. When these things are exposed, they react. Even if they lie, they still react. So I think awareness, going to the schools, going to the universities, going to the ministries with the cooperation of the heads, you know, like the perm sex or the school. I went to a lecture in Babcock the other day and um, even though I thought it was a little bit over the top, there's no such thing as corruption. No makeup. No earring. The gates are locked. You can't, children cannot leave the school. So, and they're all well behaved. There's no cult at all. I mean, that's the extreme, but it can be done. It's a faith-based organization. It is. Uh, 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 so well, what can, what can faith-based do? This is part of it. 
going to the schools, going to the Yeah, I mean, that's their doctrine. But those who don't have such an extreme doctrine can still go out there and um, teach their students just morality. It doesn't even have to be Christian or, or whatever. Just morality. Okay. Back to you, Jumake. Anything to add? I think I'll just mention briefly that parents may not know the disservice that they do their children by trying to make sure that they're up to date. <laughs> yes. I think it's so, if I just take Lagos, and I'm just generalizing here, but it's just what you see. You talked about children going in the right car. Because the society is now so competitive and so materialistic, children only mirror what they get from their parents. So if their parents are so concerned about being seen in the right car, then the children are so concerned. If the parents are so concerned about being seen in the right clothes, the right bag and accessories, then the children at a very young age are already conscious about that. If the parents speak down to drivers and nannies, then you find, and this is a pet peeve of mine, you find young kids handing their bags to people old enough to be their parents. I see it, whether it's at music school, whether it's at you know, school pickup, wherever. The moms are not there, the dads are not there. The children have two or three adults at their beck and call, and they have enough money to tip a driver a thousand naira. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah. So it's just, it's just that we really need to make sure that we're conscious about, because we may create monsters, and then by the time they're teenagers or in their 20s, we it's really are at a loss at what to do with these problem children. Let, let me tell you what a parent came to report to me one day recently. They were working with their child. Um, the child was working on the computer. They were doing some homework together. Mother went out of the room for about 15 minutes. When she came back, her son was on pornography. You know? mm. And so the mother is asking, what can I do about it? And you know, she was thinking deliverance. <laughs> And I said, do you know that you can actually block your, your you can block adult sites mm. from your son being able to access them? At home, you can do that. If you make sure the school does that, then your child can't get onto these sites. This was a child that was only about 10 years old. Mm. So, so that's corruption. It is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, the, the morality, as the Shadi was just talking about, it's really a problem. And it's the, the fabric, the very fabric of our society. If a child has a Blackberry phone, the child has access to the whole world, mm. the good, the bad, and the ugly. iPad, computer at home, without supervision, on Skype, in chat rooms. I've, you know, the kids, it's just that here, we're a bit more quiet about pedophilia and abuse and things like that. But that's a whole different conversation, Pastor. But it's the corruption of the moral fabric. Kids are now doing all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Viewers, we've kick-started a discussion on corruption, and I'm sure that, that you'll be talking about this more in your homes. We really want to say a great big thank you to both uh, Ms. Bankole Oki and Dr. Oduwale for coming to, to help us on this uh, subject today, and I'm sure that we'll have you back again not too in, in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. Um, so thank thanks for watching The Heart of the Matter today. Uh, please tune in again next week when we'll be back with another episode. Until then, stay blessed.